I'd like to welcome you to this dialogue. I think it's going to be a dialogue between the panelists and yourselves. And I am sure you ask yourself a number of questions. And we've heard throughout the day that we had a lot of questions about justice in its broad sense, transitional justice in its multifaceted sense, and transitional justice today as we see the conflict surrounding us and possibly the response to the conflict. If we take the example of Ukraine, as I said this morning, or the more recent example of conflict in Sudan, what has been the response internally and externally? And I think I'm sure you will agree with me that we ask ourselves our, uh, a number of questions. And some of them may relate to issues of democracy, respect of human rights inside those countries, but also in terms of the response, whether we get the same response on conflicts and violation of human rights and other rights in the same way. We apply the same standard, the same commitment, or whether there, there are differences. And I think that's why we are here this afternoon, is really to look at it from that perspective. And we are very lucky because we have my amazing friends and colleagues who, like me, but like many of you, have gone to various countries, have seen for themselves whether what we learn at school and university and the treaty bodies and the text, which are beautiful, which are negotiated, but are they implementable, number one? Are they implemented, number two, as we heard from the previous panelists? Is there a political will to implement? And if there is no political will, do we need to look at the way we elect our political leaders so that we make sure that we elect them, we make them accountable for those issues. I will not bore you more, and I would like to present our panelists. We have Nave Pillay, you know about her, I don't need to mention more. We have Mark, you've heard him earlier on, Betty, and then uh, Mohammed. You have in the program the explanation of the subject matter today and a sequencing, but we have changed slightly the sequencing of the panelists so that there is a progression in the discussion. And so if you allow me, I'd like to call on Navi and like for previous panelists, each panelist will have 10 minutes to speak. And I understand Navi that you will be talking to us and sharing with us um, some of the issues related to human rights violation, and you will share with us the example of Palestine and, and Ukraine. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, if you're in the last panel, and it's the end of the day, then actually I should say all protocol ignored. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> um, first, I, I really want to say how impressed by this, this university of uh, a graduate school of media and, co and communication. I mean, it's so important. Rarely have I come across a whole university training journalists, training the media. And it provides such an excellent opportunity for you. Because as law students and young journalists, um, I encourage you to confront issues and ask the questions that are not being asked. I often think that we in Africa particularly are very passive and constantly accept without questions the violations imposed on us. And particularly, COVID revealed this to us when the rich, wealthy countries hoarded 
uh, the med medicines, um, which were much more than they needed to the detriment of African states, uh, some of whom cannot afford to buy them at all. But in any case, for a long time, they were not available to us. And I felt COVID revealed the underbelly of prejudice and racism against developing countries. Now, I, wa I, also, I want to begin by saying, why did I join AGJA? Um, I, we started with AGJA because we felt it was very important to have the African perspective out there. And so because I'm committed to that, the African perspective, uh, I want to begin by, by being critical, but also to balance that by saying, um, don't get me wrong when, when I criticize what's going on. Because I was the um, High Commissioner for Human Rights who established the Human Rights Office in Ukraine, which is still functioning, and their job is to produce, to collect the data on violations of human rights on both sides. So in a conflict, there are always two sides. And the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, where I served for six years as High Commissioner, is very particular about always presenting the picture uh, that is the reality on the ground. And so therefore, I wondered who framed this question here. Uh, it's probably the one person who is not an African in Agja and is our legal advisor. <laughs> so here the question reads, the world of international criminal law and justice has been rejuvenated by ongoing accountability efforts in Ukraine. Others are asking. So there's the world, and we are the others, which, which we are named as Global South. So sorry, there's just one globe, and we're all part of it. Um, the division should be developed and developing countries, which would, which would be my substitution for Global South. Um, and, and of course, we left to ponder for the future how we might lead to greater equality in the distribution of justice for, for international crimes. Well, there's a lot of prejudice, um, a, a lot of pre presumptions about, and, and it's very racist, on what African standards should be determined by the North and what the Northern stand, standards used to be. And I watched for all this when I was a judge on the Rwanda Tribunal and also as High Commissioner for Human Rights. For instance, the UN uh, humanitarian packages distributed to, to refugees and victims in um, the Serbian conflict, and those distributed to refugees in the Rwanda, Rwandan camps were so totally different. I knew the figures then, but it was more or less like $2 value for Rwandans. That's Africa. Their needs are very less compared to whites uh, in, in Bosnia. And I see the same kind of um, racism being acted out. You all did, as you saw on television, that white Ukrainians were safely put on the trains. African students and uh, immigrants who were there were pushed out of that train, as well as Indian students who were studying, they were pushed out of the train. So these are the double standards that permeate on the ground. Unfortunately, it's supported by their governments as well. So this is where I'm heading when I address this topic. We are all concerned about the uh, war now between Russia and the Ukraine. Why? Because it impacts here. I bet the petrol price here in Kenya is as outrageous as as it is for us, and you also have shortages of food and, and other supplies. So, so the effects of war are felt by us. But my question is, why is there this feverish effort, particularly on the part of the United States, 
to pressure African governments to take sides in this war. My, uh, the, Prime, uh, the president of South Africa was invited by President Biden, and then we had the Secretary of State visit a number of African countries with the singular message, you have to condemn Russia. So my president Ramaphosa has said that South Africa wishes to remain neutral as far as that war goes. And that's how it should be. Instead of focusing on a pro-United States and pro-Russia <coughs> divide, the emphasis should be on how we, how we can get peace and justice in that continent. That, but that is missing. I am always, because I was a lawyer for many years and a judge, I would like to hear both sides of the case. But now, I can't turn on Russian TV. The Dominion user shut down that channel, I think the, about two years ago when the conflict started. So I'm now receiving just one-sided information from big channels such as the CNN and, and British BBC. So who is so afraid? Of, of, of hearing the other point of view, that they're stopping us from even getting them. And that's a concern for journalists. You need all the information to comment, comment on a situation. So one of the issues is, and I don't find journalists or even people in my country asking this, so what started all of this? What triggered the war? Did Putin just wake up one day and decide to attack? It's true, a few years ago, there was Crimea. They um, invaded, they took over Crimea, they, the Russians. They claimed that it was their territory. But the tensions on the ground were continuing between Russians who were living there, and Ukrainians. And this is why we set up the Human Rights Office to collect the information and regularly report to the Human Rights Council. So what triggered the war comes from the statement made by President Putin shortly after. He said that the Ukrainian president had, has asked to be a member of NATO. And if that is allowed, then Russia will find itself fighting NATO in Europe. And they, you know, they didn't. They have good relations with NATO. They didn't want to be on opposite sides. And so Putin gave Ukraine the opportunity to withdraw that request. He did not. Now I happen to know about some of the dis frantic discussions that were going on there. And both the UK and France took the lead in, in saying to uh, Zelensky, withdraw the statement that you made. So that's the trigger of, who tells us all this? All we see on these screens is, you know, some child has been killed, a woman has been raped, that wrenches our heartstrings. Of course, we all condemn war. Of course, we realize women and children are the, are the biggest victims, but can we have better analysis on why all this is happening? It shouldn't rely only on emotions for us to be drawn into taking sides. What's happening now, of course, we see the North supplying funds and weapons instead of getting together seriously and discussing peace and justice. Um, states in, in the West, including the states who set up the IIIM mechanism, have sent two petitions to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan. One petition asked him to investigate Ukraine. The other petition asked him not to investigate the situation in Palestine. Double standards. It's the same international law, and aggression is going on in, on, in both situations. And in any case, no state should be telling the prosecutor what to do. Uh, however, he went ahead and issued this indictment in respect of Ukraine 
which <laughs> I haven't even got to my main point. <laughs> Um, which is which is good. We commend him for working expeditiously on the Ukraine indictment. Um, you know why he couldn't charge for aggression, because the definition of aggression that was uh, agreed to here in Kampala uh, required that a state be a party to the Rome Statute in order to be prosecuted for aggression, and Russia is not a party. And who put that clause in mainly is the United States to protect themselves. Uh, but now they are, you know, really want to use that. So that's why there are calls for uh, a separate tribunal to charge Putin for aggression. Um, so I want to talk a bit about the commissions of inquiry. I now chair the Commission of Inquiry into Israel, Palestine, and East Jerusalem. It's a very wide mandate. It does not have an end date, so it's per permanent. And we are asked, three commissioners, we are asked to find the root causes of the conflict and then make recommendations and also investigate crimes and, and, co and cooperate with uh, justice institutions. Um, this resolution in the Human Rights Council was opposed by Western states. And when I delivered the first report in June last year, some of those attacks were hurled at us. And the United States, for instance, said, we, you, you can't have a permanent commission of inquiry. There's no cutoff date. And therefore, we're not going to support this. And I had to tell the ambassador, you've done it before. You set up the IIIM mechanism, which does not have an end date. You are paying for that commission, very generously too, I should say. Uh, so there was no silence. That was my response over there. But that's the main reason why there's objection from Israel, United States, and several European states. Uh, to this Commission of Inquiry, which focuses mainly on violations committed by Israel. We, uh, we then delivered a report in October in the UN, before the UN General Assembly, because the, the, this was our mandate. And over there, we recommended, after uh, extensive factual and legal findings, really, it's a lot of work, but I'm very proud that our team produced a report like that. Not a single member state told us what's wrong with the report. Which fact are you disputing? Which law are you disputing? No, instead, they abused us by calling us anti-Semitic and biased. Even me, that I'm biased and anti-Semitic. Um, the beautiful part is the General Assembly adopted, followed our recommendation and referred the matter to the International Court of Justice for its opinion on whether perpetual occupation is lawful or unlawful. And question two, if it is unlawful, what are the responsibilities of states and non-state parties towards an unlawful occupation? You, I mean, you all know that the occupation is surviving this long, long because of the tremendous financial and moral and political support that Israel receives from Western countries. Uh, we had several meetings after that, for instance, with the European Union. You know, I, as High Commissioner, I addressed the European Union and I called for a no-fly zone over, you, over Syria to protect Syrians, because at that time, the bombs came from Assad. Uh, so obviously, I support the work of the IIII mechanism. And, and I'm very concerned about the situation in Syria. But when I addressed the European Union representative, this time as the chair of the Commission of Inquiry, they said, because one of the commissioners used the word double standards between the approach to Ukraine and the approach to 
the situation in Israel Palestine. It's double standards because the law is out there and it applies equally to both situations. And the head of it said to us, if you are going to use the word double standards, and we're not going to be talking to you or supporting you. So with those brief remarks, <laughs> can I go on another 10 minutes? <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's, it's good to laugh even in the face of so many challenging questions that Navi um, has put in front of us. And I think one of the most compelling one has been the issue of double standard with very clear, practical example, <clears throat> not only in terms of the delivery of food between two different settings or more recently in the case of how we look at conflict in one country and the other, and how the pressures to basically take sides in order to be able to continue one way or another. I'm not advocating one solution, but I think it's this question of double standards and imbalance on the international arena that is causing us uh, problems in reaching the level of justice that every human being deserves. So I said we are going to have a sequence in the way, a logical sequence, I hope, in the way we do with the panel. And so my next panelist, my esteemed friend and colleague, Mohammed, is going to speak about those levels of discussions we have in the UN Security Council and the deferral, where they go, and then whether effectively the tide has turned in Africa. So please help me in welcoming Mohammed. And the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think you will notice that our theme has two catchwords. Renewed momentum and double standards. And I tried to Google a couple of minutes ago. So double standard had about 870 million hits. And... and <laughs> So I, I, want, I, I want to address those two subjects very quickly uh, on, on two angles, uh, two branches. In terms of double standard, I mean, to, 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 to emphasize what uh, Navi uh, Pile was, was, was mentioning is really the question is whether, you know, we now have an international justice system that uh, is double tiered or on one side fast tracked and on the other side, uh, backpedal, or whether there is selectivity uh, in terms of the justice administered uh, regionally and internationally. And I take uh, for the first question really of double standard, just to reemphasize, and looking at uh, Security Council deferral. I think you know that for the ICC, you have three avenues in which the court is seized with jurisdiction. First one is referral by states, and you had, in, in, in so far as Africa is concerned, DRC, Central African Republic, Mali, and Uganda were self-referral by African states to the ICRC, to the ICC, and you have Security Council deferral uh, when the Security Council acts under Chapter Seven uh, uh, of the UN Charter in situation where it has determined. There's a threat to international peace and security. And the third one is in investigations by the prosecutor himself, proprio moto or suo moto, that is on his or her own initiatives. So during, in the history of the ICC, we've had two deferrals. 2005 is the situation in Darfur. And then you have 2011, the situation in Libya. Okay, which was voted 15 to 0, the Libyan one, in 2011. 
So we have a period of 12 years in which the Security Council has not deferred any situation uh, to the ICC. And the question is, has there not been, in this period of 12 years, equivalent situation of similar gravity or higher gravity that merited to be channeled by the Security Council by way of referral to the ICC? I could take other example, but I prefer to take Yemen. Because Yemen, I thought, well, it was on the other side of the Red Sea. You have Sudan on one side and Yemen on the other side. So Yemen situation today, eight years of what the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the last Human Rights Council session referred to as a brutal warfare going on for eight years, the death toll over 230 million, the thousand, 70 percent children, both situations considered a threat to international peace and security, both uh, uh, situation of conflict, non-international and international because of the involvement of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, uh, in the conflict, uh, and so on. So you have to see here where the Security Council in Yemen situation has not acted, and, and in other situations, Libya and so on, it has acted. So really, I think one clear example where, where you could see uh, uh, some double standard operating because uh, of the different, of the considerations if they were, if they had mattered. Uh, as I said, you know, armed conflict between both the two non-state parties, again, Yemen non-state parties, the other Libya non-state party, Sudan non-state party. So there's a lot of similarity you could, you could draw uh, in terms of, uh, so there's no, I think, principal reason in my view, apart from lack of political will, why the Security Council has not acted uh, 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 in the Yemen situation. But then the Security Council did not act. What about the High Commission for Human Rights? What about the Human Rights Council? That is the human rights mechanism. So there the human rights mechanism, maybe you could say as, uh, as, as, as an alternative route, it set up an international commission, uh, a group of experts, 2019, this group of experts, was it was voted in by unanimous vote of all the members of the Human Rights Council, 47. Four years later, comes in a resolution to disband, not to renew the mandate of this commission. Well, the war is going on. So it was disband uh, uh, in a vote of... Uh, of uh, uh, on 7th of October 2021 by 24 no, 21 members no, seven abstained and 18 said yes to the renewal of the mandate. So the mandate was not renewed. But when you talk about double standard, I mean, there is a tendency only to, to put the blame on Security Council members. I think African states need also to face reality. I think they are not also spotless or stainless or faultless. So if you look at the Yemen situation, who voted non-renewal of the mandate? We have our best friends, Senegal, Somalia, Sudan, Togo, Gabon, Eritrea, Burkina Faso, Namibia, Mal Namibia, Malawi, Cote d'Ivoire abstained. So again, uh, uh, so the double standard may be operating at the Security Council level, but I think uh, uh, we cannot uh, not pinpoint to our own contribution of our own states, and therefore, you know, the need for us and civil society to be vigilant uh, in terms of of, of 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 where we go. So political will, and then the role of civil society. But let me say also. The other aspect I want to say about renewed momentum in a couple of, uh, the issue of double standards, and this is a word used 
in resolutions of the African Union. So it's not only a, a word that we use in a political sense or in a legal sense, but it was used in official uh, decisions of the heads of state uh, of the uh, African Union. And there was, as you know, uh, an attempt by African states to withdraw en masse or to pull out from the ICC. I think that is a situation of the past, in my view. Uh, much as a couple of weeks ago, the president of South Africa mentioned about pulling out of the ICC, but it was quickly retracted by the ANC. So I think no mass withdrawal, no single withdrawal. I think this debate is out. But I think there is also a repositioning of the ICC. And you can see a repositioning also in terms of where the prosecution is going. Currently, 17 out of 10 situations, uh, 10 situations out of 17 are from Africa. So it was not before the majority of situations, 10 out of 17. And then you have, for the first time, four situations in Asia. Okay, that's, so that's one indication there where there may be a renewed momentum to go a different direction. That is, that the, the, the ICC menu is not fully African, okay? The ICC menu includes other situation, non-African, and we see clearly now four in Asia. There is in Europe, apart from Georgia and so on, which is in uh, uh, Ukraine. I think the second is that there have been, uh, you could see a re-engagement of the ICC uh, with African states uh, moving forward. So we have in Central African Republic, uh, cooperation with the Special uh, Criminal Court. First trials have begun. You see in Guinea, where the prosecutor has made a finding where national authorities are no longer inactive or otherwise unwilling to prosecute those who are involved in the stadium accident, uh, event in 2008 in Nigeria and then uh, in Uganda uh, in relation to the situation in northern Uganda involving the Lord's Resistance Army and the Uganda National Defense Forces. Although, again, there are some issues there uh, about the prosecution uh, by, uh, by Ugandan uh, domestic system of members of the Ugandan uh, National Defense Forces. Uh, uh, there are some, some, some issues there. But you see, there are four situations where positive complementarity seem to be cementing. So the more you have complement, uh, uh, positive complementary being cemented, then the more I think you will have a renewed, uh, uh, a renewed uh, momentum. Uh, finally, I think, so some situations, so you could say basically just to sum up, uh, to conclude, uh, if the root of the Security Council is blocked, other mechanism uh, 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 would be, the, uh, or the, it can go parallel, which is the human rights uh, special procedures, then the domestic system, mix the system, and I think uh, just to conclude uh, what Serge Bremet said this morning, that for it effectiveness, international justice, you need really domestic, regional, and international system. Still, I think domestic is going on, international is there, of course the regional one through the AU still has to be cemented uh, because uh, much as uh, African member states, 54 member states, uh, have have, uh, have adopted the, the, the Malabo Protocol, uh, which extended the criminal jurisdiction of the African court, still very few have ratified the treaty in terms of granting criminal jurisdiction uh, at a regional level. Uh, I think there is also uh, backpedaling to an extent because a number of states also have withdrawn uh, the uh, possibility for individuals to petition or civil society organization to petition before the African Court on Human and Pe People's Rights, which is really a regression. Uh, so I think we have to see uh, uh, there are, as I said, just to conclude, uh, opportunities for renewed momentum, but I think the question of double standards, in my view, still persists, and it has to continue to be addressed. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, um, Hamid. Um, I think it was important to push the envelope and the boundaries of the question of double standards following on from what Navi was saying, and but also you managed to bring some clarity in the fact that it's not a one-way issue and that in some cases, even our member states, I'm speaking about Africa, voting against renewal of a mandate or any particular decision. So it's not always um, a particular a group that is against those. I think it was very important also to hear that there's been a process to address the issue or the perception that ICC has been set up only to prosecute Africans, right? And that we see today the number of cases that go beyond Africa is, is, is very important. And I think that's a very important question. And whether we have actually <laughs> turned the tide and we can uh, use the momentum. You, you, I think you responded positively in the sense that today it's not just the ICC, but the domestic courts, uh, but that we need to work a little bit more on the regional court. Uh, and that would be a challenge for uh, regional organizations like the African Union. And it can only happen, I think, if we in civil society continue to bring more pressure to ask for uh, evolution on those questions and basically to hold the people we elect to hold them accountable. Right. Um, my next speaker, <laughs> you know him, is Mark. And I believe Mark is going to bring us back to the question of Ukraine from the perspective of looking at the concept of aggression, one country aggressing another country, and, and whether the proposed international um, or hybrid tribunal to prosecute is something to be discussed and to look at the narrative. And I think he's going to also explore, if I'm not wrong, to whom this is persuasive. And I believe, Mark, you'll bring us back to the issue, I will not say global south, but to, to, to the issue of north-south um, um, sort of um, questions that have been put on the table. And I think in doing that, you may also be speaking about double standards. So the floor is yours. Please help me in welcoming Mark. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much, Fatia, and and thank you, Navi, for pointing out that the wording in the in, in the description could be uh, problematic because, in some ways, uh, I, I will talk about aggression. But what I'm really interested is in is the words that we use to justify international criminal law, and whether the way that we describe accountability itself includes, and the need for accountability in some contexts actually includes hints of double standards. Um, and what I'm really interested in, and I will use this, you know, and, and in the description it has Global South in quotes because it's a very imperfect category. We can call them developing states or the non-aligned movement. But what I'm interested in trying to understand is why accountability efforts in Ukraine do not seem to resonate within communities in the global south or developing nations. And how would we understand that? What stories are global north or western states in particular saying about the need for accountability? How do they justify the need for accountability in Ukraine? But before I get into that, I think it's really useful to, 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 to know what Ukraine has received or what has happened in Ukraine with respect to justice and accountability. 41 states, 41 states referred the situation in Ukraine to the International Criminal Court. Unprecedented number. There's a UN Commission of Inquiry on investigating human rights violations there. 
On top of that, at least a dozen states outside of Ukraine, including Canada, Spain, United Kingdom, etc., have opened their own investigations, their own national investigations into crimes committed in Ukraine. While they get refugees coming from Ukraine into the country, they interview them about war crimes that they may have witnessed, they build cases, they share that with other bodies and perhaps will investigate and prosecute these crimes themselves. Millions of dollars have been sent to the International Criminal Court specifically for the purpose of supporting the investigation in Ukraine. And on top of it, because as we heard uh, from Navi, the ICC cannot prosecute the crime of aggression, states are talking about creating a brand new court, a separate court, specifically to prosecute Russian aggression in Ukraine. Ukraine deserves all of this, but so do other states. Sudan does not deserve less than what Ukraine is receiving. Palestine does not deserve less than what Ukraine is receiving. Syria and Afghanistan do not deserve any less than this. It is not a problem that Ukraine is receiving this attention and this funding and these courts and these ideas and this support. The problem is that other states do not get it, including states who experience the same types of atrocities, sometimes by the very same actors. For example, in Georgia, you have Russia, ag Russian aggression, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Now, Part of this conversation and part of the word play problem, and I do understand that categories are imperfect, is that Ukraine itself is not a global North or Western state. It is not. I'm Polish by heritage. Polish people or the Poland as a country in Eastern Europe is only Western when states, when Western states want it to be. And when it does things that the West doesn't want it to do, we're something else. We're a little bit Eastern or something not exactly alike to the West or to the global North. And it's important not to mix up or to confuse the fact that global north states and western states are supporting accountability in Ukraine, but Ukraine itself is a victim of the same types of imperial and colonial-like violence that many other states in the world have. Yet this is still not resonating. We do not talk about Russia as committing imperial atrocities or colonial violence on Ukraine, even though if we think about it, it is going into a sovereign state and saying, this part of it is mine, and I'm going to move in my own people from my state into this place, and I'm going to steal your children. That is almost exactly what happened with the United Kingdom when it came in as a colonial power into Canada. But that's not how we talk about it. That's not the story we're telling. We're telling other stories. So why is it resonating? I talk to many colleagues in the global north or in the you know, quote unquote west who are surprised. They think, of course, it should resonate in developed states of the global south, what is happening in Ukraine and these accountability efforts. And they're surprised that they're not. But I think there are reasons that, there is it, that they're not. We have to acknowledge, first and foremost, that some of the reasons why certain non-aligned or developing states or global south states don't support accountability in Ukraine is for self-serving interests. Mali won't support any accountability for Russia. And Mali's also paying Wagner, the Wagner Group, $10 million a week to support its military. It's not going to support accountability in Ukraine no matter what. Same as Haftar in Libya, the Central African Republic, that uses Russian forces. But there are some real concerns. Navi talked about this. There are real concerns about systemic racism. It's hard not to look at the situation in Ukraine and not come away with the, with the impression, the distinct impression, that because this is happening in Europe, it gets more attention than if it would happen anywhere else. It's hard not to, to realize that. The legacy of Iraq and the invasion of Iraq is a shadow on all conversations about aggression. That does not mean that aggression should not be prosecuted in Ukraine when it's, conduct, when it's committed by Russia. But it is very hard to accept states that have done very little about aggression in Iraq now saying that aggression has to be prosecuted. And when we saw on the anniversary of the illegal invasion of Iraq, the highest level American authorities still call this a mistake as if they tripped on a cord and fell into another state. That's not what happens. 
They planned that. They invaded another state illegally, and they knew it was illegal. It was conscious. It was exactly, it was conscious. And it's very hard to take lessons from a state or from other, its allies, when that's, that shadow still looms. There is also, I think, a general assumption amongst global North states, whatever you want to call them, Western states, that what happens in the global South, and I don't just mean the African continent, but Latin America, large parts of Asia, et cetera, that what happens in these areas is of primary importance to communities in those areas and institutions in those areas. But if something happens in Europe, it's of relevance to the entire world. And that's not really fair. I don't think that's fair. And I think that is a double standard in the way that we think and talk about it. And finally, on top of this, when we talk about the crime of aggression and the creation of a new court, a brand new court specifically designed to singularly investigate and prosecute uh, Russian authorities and maybe Belarusian authorities for the crime of aggression, again, good idea. But who are the people advocating for this? One of the primary people advocating for this is Gordon Brown, the former UK Prime Minister, who was in government when the United Kingdom joined the United States in invading Iraq. And what does he write in his opinion pieces? We will prosecute Russian aggression, but if you're an American citizen or an American or British person right now, don't worry because we won't ever touch Iraq. How could this do anything but not turn off masses of audiences who are not interested in simply what aboutism, but asking what about us? Wh why can't we get similar attention, similar care, similar stories, similar people advocating for justice and accountability in contexts like Syria, Afghanistan, Palestine, etc. Now, the last thing that I think might be slightly problematic is what we hear a lot about the, the Nuremberg moment. For those of you who are following accountability efforts in, in Ukraine, it's often framed in Ukraine has a Nuremberg moment, a Nuremberg moment to achieve justice and accountability. And my question is to whom is this convincing? I've worked now in international criminal law and justice for almost 10 years or just over 10 years. I've traveled to Sri Lanka, to Colombia, et cetera, many developing states that are having these moments. And not, I've never been to a single one where they said, we need international criminal law because we have a Nuremberg moment. I'm interested in why we use words and we ask people to advocate for justice and accountability in places like Ukraine that cannot resonate elsewhere and yet demand or are surprised when it doesn't resonate elsewhere. There are other narratives. The crime of aggression can be prosecuted as a crime against humanity. Much better narrative. Crime against humanity is a crime against all of us, all of humanity. The Malibu Protocol, as imperfect as it is, tells a different narrative of why you need prosecutions for international crimes. You need them because they're tied to corruption. You need to prosecute international crimes because they're tied to wildlife trafficking. You need them because they're tied to government staying in power for too long. That's a really persuasive narrative, and perhaps one that is more persuasive than simply the shorthand of a Nuremberg moment that may, of course, not resonate in other communities. Whatever the narrative is, and I'm wrapping up, I promise, whatever the narrative is, Michael said earlier today, we have to do the hard work and not be shy about doing the hard work. Whatever narrative we're trying to tell about international criminal justice, about global accountability, we have to think really hard to make sure, as I clearly didn't, Navi, in my description of this panel, of how to use words that bring us together in a global narrative that makes it clear that what is happening in Ukraine, imperial colonial violence, does matter to other places and communities who have experienced imperial colonial violence. That's possible, but only if we change the story. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mark. I think uh, we are saying that the experience is that we use words that divide us and polarize us. And I think the Nuremberg one, why is it resonating with a particular category of people is precisely that, is to galvanize 
and to get the support in order to move forward. And if you allow me, all of you, I think we spoke about double standards in various forms and formats. But one thing that we haven't said is that many of the double standards that we see are basically um, driven by geopolitical interest and economic interest. And that is why we see very different approach to how we deal with Palestine, for instance, and how we deal with other parts of this world. And I think we have to keep in mind that this is what is driving the investment here or there. And Iraq is a very important question that you, you brought to the table, uh, Mark, and that they still talk about it as a mistake when they know that they did it intently with all the information they wanted to, to have. So we need to be vigilant about um, the kind of narrative we believe and we pursue because they definitely uh, perpetuate not only double standard but biases and many other issues that we saw in the colonial times. Anyway, I'll shut up here and I'd like maybe to uh, get my dear friend Betty to come to the table, <laughs> to the podium. And Betty is going to help us look at issues of um, why we still have such gaps in impunity, right? Why is it that between yesterday and today we heard a lot about the fact that there is still impunity. One case in order has been Sudan uh, 20 years on when we heard our friend this morning. And the failures of our states to prevent. Why is it that they don't do it? They have a responsibility. And what we need to do to focus uh, and to advance justice goals. And I think Betty is the best place to address all those questions. Betty, welcome. Thank you, Fatia. Thank you very much. Of course, I'll, I will not resist also wading into this uh, double standards business uh, by quoting to you something a British Lord, Daniel Hannan, said uh, in a commentary in the Telegraph, a newspaper in the Daily Telegraph, uh, just after the uh, uh, events of 24th February last year uh, in, in Ukraine. And he said this, they seem so like us. That is what makes it so shocking. Ukraine is a European country. Its people watch Netflix and have Instagram accounts. War is no longer something visited upon impoverished and remote populations. In the same week, another visibly emotional uh, Lucy Watson of ITV News, reporting from Kyiv, had this to say. Now the unthinkable has happened to them. And this is not a developing third world nation. This is Europe. We are a European city, and we have cruise missile fire as though we're in Iraq or Afghanistan. Can you imagine? So really, uh, let's not overthink this um, as to the motivations. Uh, but I really now want to address the questions uh, about, you know, so now what? You know, I feel as if I'm in a time warp. A couple of you in this room have been in conversations with me uh, more than 10, 15 years ago. Some of you were very young, Chris and Tina. We were having this same conversation about double standards when we were grappling with what to do uh, to contribute as we're contributing to the African uh, transitional justice framework. 
We were having this circular uh, conversation. I was in Rome in 1998 at the Rome Diplomatic Conference for the ICC, the, 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 the treaty that established the International Criminal Court, and we were in Rome for five weeks. And the largest contingent of the supporters of the ICC uh, were from Africa. In fact, up to now, they form the largest state party group of the ICC. I believe there are 34 in total. So in terms of momentum, answering the question of momentum that um, uh, has been put to us, I think since the early years uh, of the existence of the International Criminal Court, we have had momentum. And I'll tell you what, the momentum has been in our policy articulation, in uh, domesticating international criminal norms uh, into a, a domestic legislation. Uh, the earlier panel here, Tabitha talked about, uh, like for example, Kenya's implementing legislation for the ICC uh, uh, statute, uh, which is uh, our International Crimes uh, Act. Uh, many countries in our region have uh, implementing legislation uh, and uh, for, for the uh, Rome Statute. So I think the question that I want to put to you, and so that we can start, we can you know start thinking about how not to get caught up in that double standard argument. I think it's been articulated well uh, by the prior speakers, but I'm I'm trying to challenge us to go beyond that and see. So beyond this normative and policy advances that we have seen on our continent, and here I'm addressing myself to Africans and uh, you know, other developing and far-flung populations uh, you know, that uh, think that somebody else owes them uh, to come and fix things uh, when these situations arise. What have we done? Where is the evidence that in all our advanced um, and domesticated criminal justice laws that we have, uh, 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 have articulated since the early 2000s, how can we show that we have strengthened the rule of law, that we are upholding uh, those principles? Why do we think somebody else should come and do it for us? That's, you know, that's a question I'm, I'm, I'm putting out there. And in putting this question, I just want to say that crimes under the ICC jurisdiction continue to be committed, even within uh, state parties, especially within state parties. The same state parties have been very, very reluctant to um, exercise jurisdiction under the complementarity framework of the Rome Statute. They refuse to do it. I'm sorry, Tabitha, I don't know whether she's left. Uh, but one case about a little six-month-old who should never have been killed uh, in political protest uh, is coming uh, 10 years too late. Uh, over during the 2008, the Office of the Prosecutor in this country investigated 450 cases. None of them saw the light of day uh, in any of our courts. The Kenyan courts have always had uh, jurisdiction over international uh, crimes. They could have prosecuted uh, um, uh, those cases that arose out of those uh, uh, incidents. So now turning to uh, what we are calling this new momentum. One of the issues that I want to put on the table that hasn't come out clearly is the speed at which uh, there was action. The speed at which there was action, not just by the ICC prosecutor, but by state parties and non-state parties. State parties to the ICC and non-state parties. And I just want to uh, go back briefly and show how we can uh, also, if there is willingness, uh, also act in those types of situations. So Russia invaded uh, Ukraine on the 24th of February. Uh, within four days of that invasion, the prosecutor of the ICC uh, made a statement that he wanted to open an investigation. 
But he hadn't, before he could even do anything about it, by the 4th of March, the Human Rights Council, thank you, Navi, the Human Rights Council had already passed a resolution uh, on the situation uh, uh, in Ukraine and appointed and recommended the appointment of a commission and so on, and that was done. And then we have this 41 or 43 states. I thought there were 43. They began making referrals to the ICC prosecutor uh, uh, on the Ukraine situation from March 1st. This was how many days after the invasion? A week, less than a week. Uh, and by the 1st of April, the 43 states had already made their referral, and, and the prosecutor didn't have to do anything on his own motion because the states had done it. Um, secondly, the state parties then immediately responded to the prosecutor's request for resources to support his office in the investigations of, uh, uh, in Ukraine. And within less than 10 days, the investigation had begun. Okay, we're talking momentum. The Sudan uh, recent conflict happened, what, a month ago? It's now been a month. Uh, and people are scrambling. We are scrambling around looking for uh, assistance to do uh, open source investigation because nobody is offering that kind of assistance. I believe one state, I shall not name them, provided 41 forensic investigators to go into Ukraine immediately in March when they were preserving the evidence, okay? Um, then there is the question of what the European states did. These are Europeans, by the way, I'm not, I think they did the right thing. They came to the aid of one of their own. Uh, they were joined by the US, the EU, the US, which is not even a state party to the Rome Statute, and the United Kingdom established something known as the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group to provide technical and operation support to Ukraine's investigators and prosecutors. How lovely is that? I mean, these are really powerful uh, nations, but they did it for their, one of their own. Then they also established something known as the OTP Trust Fund, dedicated to advancing technology and specialized capacity over and above their own assess contributions. Are we African states paying our contributions to the, uh, the ICC? Are we paying contributions to the Africa Union? What is the Africa Union doing ar around the situation in, uh, in, uh, in Sudan itself? But let me also just uh, remind you, and some of you here, I, I love the young law students and the young journalists. How many of you remember that uh, one month or three weeks after the Ukraine situation, there was a radio station here in Kenya which mobilized money, resources to send to Ukraine. You people donated money. Right or wrong? Am I right? Do you remember it was on Kiss or Capital, one of those classic, one of those early morning uh, shows? Kenyans, young people like you, we went there, we paid money, and we went to the Ukrainian embassy, and we delivered money, which we keep saying we don't have, high cost of living. <laughs> eh? We went and we delivered this money, and we said, please, we're in solidarity with Ukraine. That is a very good thing that we did. Have we done it for Sudan? So what is wrong with us? So let's not keep talking about double standards. How many minutes do I still have a few minutes? So in terms of, of, of uh, a way forward, because I think there's a way forward, there's this thing we're always saying, African solutions, uh -huh. Every time we don't want uh, to go under some kind of microscope, we want to commit atrocities against our own people, we want to do corruption, we don't want asset recovery, we don't want to act regionally. In the morning, somebody, a young student there, one of these ladies raised the question about what are we doing about asset recovery and what, how are we linking it to transitional justice? 
And that, I'm going to end on that note because there is hope. I, there is a lot of hope. We need to strengthen our regional system, but it's not just regional systems of international criminal justice mechanisms. It is our regional systems that are committed to fighting corruption, for example, so that when you're committing offenses in South Sudan and stealing the money that is funding the war, you don't come and spend it here in Kenya by building a mall that I go to. You shouldn't do that. Half the malls in this city are owned by South Sudanese and Somalians. So let's not please hide behind this what about us. It's not about, it is us who need to do something about this mess we are in. We can't be blaming a uh, European Union for putting millions and millions of their own taxpayers' monies, and as we are sending our own taxpayers' monies, also little ones, to Ukraine, when we don't want to fund our own justice initiatives. <laughs> so that is one. Let us strengthen our regional, we strengthen our regional and domestic uh, systems. Our domestic systems, the panel that was here before us, I think Tina uh, did a great job in highlighting the cases they have filed. For me, that is an example of localizing and claiming. Because we have such a progressive constitution, and many of our nations have progressive constitutions, and we have a government, I think, which is also trying to establish itself as a leader uh, in, in peace building, uh, you know, and so on, we can challenge them. We have already done so much in terms of constitution, uh, constitutional reform in strengthening our criminal justice institutions. We have now a very professional cohort of prosecutors in this country. Those of you from ODPP know that. We have professional uh, prosecutors. Those prosecutors can match any international prosecutors with just a little bit of training on international criminal uh, prosecutions and investigations. They can do this. They have the money. It has been increased. The other day I heard the, uh, I don't know who was talking about how much money the office of the prosecutor is now uh, having. The police has now become independent. So there are opportunities there. And these opportunities are everywhere. So let us look to ourselves in terms of, um, you know, strengthening our own domestic systems, learning how to uh, claim our rights, um, and, and, and also meeting our international obligations where they arise, our obligations to cooperate. Why do we want um, the European Union or whoever to come and set up things for us when we have a case uh, which we ourselves, perhaps, uh, speaking for Uganda, for example, you refer your, your own situation to the ICC and then you don't cooperate. It doesn't make any sense. We have to stop this uh, whataboutism and, uh, uh, you know, crying around double standards. Let's create our own standards and let's make them work. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Um, that was powerful. From all perspective, um, I think you helped in the question of the double standard, but also in looking at when we demand a right for human rights or for whatever, we also have a responsibility as Africans. Uh, and, and I always come back to the issue of our own conscience. So we cannot always be waiting for things to come to us, but we need to go to, to things. And I think that was very, very important. I, I liked the quotes that you had at the very beginning when the aggression of Ukraine happened. Actually, I was sitting in the UK and I could see what was happening, not only in terms of the open sources of information via uh, newspapers, uh, interviews, but the images at the borders, particularly I'm speaking about the UK, I won't speak about any other country, at the borders where you had Afghans, Syrians, other people trying to cross and being pushed and the rest being welcomed. And, and I think it stays with people, not that anybody is questioning the support 
for Ukraine, which is absolutely necessary for any country that is being aggressed. But the, the other side of the coin is the biggest question, I think. And, and it brings us back to the subject of this symposium, which is the, the, the issue of justice and transitional justice. And we feel that it is lacking. It is lacking in, in many countries. And again, we go, come back to Sudan. I'll shut up here, and I'd like to open the floor for questions. I'd like, I would suggest that we take a round of four questions first. We have four panelists. And we'll see, right? Please, because this, this was a very important panel. Not that the others were not, no, but we need the, the, the time for it. Four questions. The first person I saw was you, and then I'll take Michael, yourself, and Charlo. And then we see. Uh, good afternoon. Afternoon, yes. Good afternoon once more. Um, I forgot to say my name last time, so let me do it now. Uh, my name is Roy Miner, and I am in the Kenya School of Law right now. And if you could allow me, I'd want to play the devil's advocate for a minute. Uh, we've been talking about double standards uh, throughout, and we've made it very clear that there are certain developed countries that get m way more attention than, um, for example, we've, we've given uh, the example of Ukraine and Sudan, right? Now, the reason I want to be the devil for a minute is by asking, would it be wrong necessarily uh, to focus more on Ukraine than Sudan? especially because uh, most of the people in business, in whatever, they're making more money pretty much from Ukraine than they would from Sudan. The same way um, a person who's not making, a person who's not returning more money to a particular sector would be ignored more than a person who's ideally more important. Simply put, what I'm asking is, uh, isn't this a product of uh, what economic gain that they get from these particular countries as opposed to how much we care or don't care about them. Yes. Hi, um, my question is for Betty. Um, I just wanna follow up on what you were saying about why should someone else come and do it for us? We often see some countries, you know, like Argentina who exercise universal jurisdiction and then in Europe we see countries like Germany, France, Belgium, who exercise jurisdiction with respect to international crimes when perpetrators arrive on their territory. My question for you is why not Kenya? I looked just briefly at the International Crimes Act and Article 8 suggests that if perpetrators of international crimes are on the territory of Kenya, then these fabulous prosecutors that you just referred to would have jurisdiction, right? So, and we hear over and over again by the recently elected president that, you know, Kenya is asserting itself as a regional leader. And if we look around in the neighborhood, there are a lot of international crimes being committed. By in South Sudan, there are allegations. In Sudan, there are allegations. In Congo, there are allegations. Ethiopia, allegations. So, I, also to the people in this crowd, these young, women and men with tremendous capacity. Should they be answering this call? Hello, my name is Ryan Kamundia, a student of Lord Riera University. And my question, I think, is uh, addressed to uh, Madame Betty. Uh, we've talked about double standards from Africans themselves. So, and if you work on that, of course, we'd be at a much better position and therefore, should we be looking to expand international justice or to cut it down? Although that would <laughs> render many of you unemployed, because I mean, <laughs> because I mean, if we, we're talking about complementarity, so we all agree that we should have mechanisms inside our own country themselves. So if that's perfect, then why can't we just work on that? Every country to be good on its own, such that we don't have to, you know go above that and have all these arguments. Thank you. I'm Chalo Ali from Sudan. Uh, I am a journalist. I work for Radio Tamazuj. Uh, I have a question to the panelists and uh, especially our senior respected former Chief Justice from Tanzania. 
our immediate neighbor here, they have never had election for chief justice for ever since they created that country. <laughs> South Sudan. Chief, what is the region doing? For, we are talking about transitional and you know justice and all this. What are you people doing, the former and the current, from these countries that have at least done a step of having those elections to make sure that leadership, the, those positions are supposed not to be just there until you die? What are you doing as a region to make sure that there is transitional laws and justice happening to the people who have been uh, uh, victimized with the, by war in South Sudan and even in Sudan? Number two, Betty and, and, and Nevi, and also the consultant, I think this is also following you. Yes, the journalists here, I'm sure the researchers and uh, even the law students, they have been, we, we were able to see, to foresee some of these things happening. The war in Sudan had been reported many times before it has occurred, even in South Sudan and many other neighboring countries. What can be done in future to make sure that we prevent this kind of wars to happen before it happens and then we, start, we talk about justice? Yeah, the question relates to the the uh, appointment of judges, uh, okay, and, and I will, well, the situation in the Commonwealth, okay, is that in majority of cases, uh, judges are appointed by the heads of state, by the head of state, whether it is the president or the prime minister, on the recommendation of a judicial service commission. Okay, so this is a situation pertaining uh, uh, in, in, in East Africa. The difference in East Africa is that in Kenya and in Uganda, Parliament endorses that nomination before it goes to the heads of state. But that position doesn't uh, uh, is not maintained in Tanzania, in many other countries, uh, uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, in uh, in Zambia. So there is no, we say, one no one size fit all system for appointment of judicial officer. I think is you you have to look at the independence uh, of the uh, the process. So we have in East Africa, uh, uh, East Africa and Southern Africa. If you can Google it. It's called the Lilongwe Principles on the Appointment of Judicial Officers. So it's a homegrown uh, principles agreed upon by SADC countries and, uh, and 19 countries in Eastern and, and South Africa, mainly to insulate. The idea is you should insulate it from political process. The question here in Kenya, a little bit advanced in the sense that in Kenya, the Judicial Commission, Service Commission only sends one name and the president rubber stamps. The president tra is a transmitting organ to the national to the to the national assembly. So there, there is, so so there are different models, but I think mostly is to ensure that it is an independent process. Uh, it is competitive based. There are a lot of criteria. Uh, vetting process. There is no judicial officer who is appointed without. It doesn't even happen in Europe. The vetting process, that is a vetting process in terms of your assets, your corruption, your ethics, not only vetted by uh, the judicial, uh, judicial Service Commission, but also vetted by the intelligence agencies. Uh, and that report goes uh, uh, to the appointing authority. Uh, so in terms of your, your behavior, if you are a thief in secondary school, it will reflect, it will reflect. <laughs> So, Muldi, I think it's, it's uh, uh, there is improvements to be made. Uh, I think improvements to be made in terms of uh, uh, competitiveness, so that you don't have only from the judiciary, you must have a crossbreed from the legal profession, uh, from the bar association, from academia. We didn't have academia uh, judges. Yeah. Now in Tanzania, you have almost, uh, out of 120 judges, you have about 15 who are PhDs and who were professors of law, yeah, in the judiciary. It never happened before. So I think there is some improvement, but again, still, it is capacity building also, which is needed throughout, because most of them, as I say, international crime, 
is new and uh, now we talk about open source is even newer and there are a lot of new areas which really uh, they don't have uh, any any knowledge so with, yeah. thank you um, thank you i think i'll start with the last uh, charles uh, question around uh, incorporating prevention as part of transitional justice in fact that is a new approach uh, I think Chris forgot to talk about it. So, so when I think it was Mikel or somebody else who was talking about reparations and mentioned uh, that uh, guarantees of non-repetition are a reparatory measure, but actually now it's also around preventing the violations from happening. So transitional justice, even under the African Union's transitional justice uh, framework, um, it is proposed that all transitional justice initiatives be undertaken with a preventive uh, uh, lens, a preventive approach. So that is something that is uh, seriously being uh, considered. Uh, Brian from Riyar University was uh, talking about, why don't we just forget about all this international? <laughs> huh? We can't, because you know international law uh, is part of our law. The ICC is a court of last resort. The only reason we are talking about it is because we have been unwilling uh, to exercise jurisdiction for those most serious crimes. Not that we can't, we can. And we even have the law to allow us. So no, we are not going to forget about it. We are also going to redouble our own efforts to do what Mikel was suggesting, which is also exercise universal jurisdiction. Uh, without going into too much detail, there, there are very many good reasons why we have, bad reasons why we haven't exercised universal jurisdiction. Part of those reasons can be explained, for example, in 2010, during the promulgation of our very progressive constitution. Guess who was our chief guest? One of our chief guests? Al Bashir. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. And he was welcomed with a lot of fanfare. Oh, uh, I think some people sitting here thought they could go to court and, and get uh, an arrest warrant for him. It didn't work. <laughs> Them themselves, they were arrested, according to Chalo. Uh, but, uh, you know, we will not get there. And this is what I meant by saying we need to actually... Uh, not just have the normative and policy advances and whatever it is and change our laws. We have to change our culture about how we're, op you know, uh, dealing with these, uh, these questions. Nobody is going to come and do it for us. Nobody, nobody is going to do it for us. We have to do it for ourselves. And the very casual way in which we dismiss international criminal eff justice efforts is, you know, points to this uh, direction. Um, the devil's advocate, I think, <laughs> uh, I think it's about, it's about the value of lives. Uh, I know you are being a, a devil's advocate, but it's about uh, all lives matter, whether it's a white life or a black life or a brown life or whatever kind of life. I think that's what, you know, all these principles we keep talking about, they equalize us all. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, on the devil's advocate uh, question, too, just just on the economic, because I think I think there is something to that. Um, perhaps not within the justice and accountability framework, but mi migration, which I think is a global justice issue um, that also relates directly to international justice efforts. I can tell you, for example, that in Canada, I've been working um, on p a potential uh, lawsuit of discriminatory treatment uh, for between Ukrainian migrants versus Afghan migrants and the obligations that Canada has to them. Ukrainian migrants who come have their tuition fees reduced to domestic fees. Afghan migrants, certainly Sudanese migrants will not. Why? For economic reasons, but also because of an extraordinarily unfair judgment, which is that Canada believes that Ukrainian students will go back to Ukraine and Sudanese, Afghan, and others won't. They'll stay. So they should pay. They should pay the full fees. 
Um, and I think that, that that is an economic, there is an economic element to this that we ignore a lot. And that Malibu, for all of its faults, for all of Malibu, the Malibu Protocol's faults, it includes within it the possibility of linking financial crimes, transnational organized crimes, and corruption to international criminal law, migration, et cetera. And that is a very interesting and important, and in my view, more accurate description of how to deal with atrocities. Because atrocities aren't, don't just happen because someone shot someone, it happens because someone sold someone that gun, that gun could go through a port, that people ignored that, that gun going through the port, through corruption, et cetera. The last thing I'd say uh, on this is, I think when it comes to double standards, we also need to kind of see the forest for the trees. I was there at the Assembly of States parties when Kenya brought 70 or 75 Kenyan delegates to basically ask for the ICC to pay less attention to Kenya. How you could send 75 delegates for less attention, I don't know, but they, they did that. And this was a period when the African Union was saying double standards. There's too many double standards because there's too much attention on African states. Last ASP, I talked to a Kenyan delegate, and she said, she said, you know, these, these, these conferences used to be all about us. I kind of missed that. Now it's all about Ukraine. It's all about Ukraine. Um, you know, and I think now the double standard is actually that there's not enough attention on not just African situations, but situations outside of basically uh, Ukraine. And I think we should take that seriously and commit to something more coherent or at least more consistent that says double standards are wrong all of the time. And there are always going to be self-interested people who call double standards who actually just want to, you to look the other way. But we can do better than that and call double standards out all of the time. And with Ukraine, hopefully, and I really do think this is a hope, that it sets a standard or a precedent that you can always now say, you did this for Ukraine, you should now do the same thing for Sudan. And when others tell you no, then, then you, we can always point to double standards. So using it as a precedent Absolutely. to make a case. Well, at least Mark ends with a good note that we can use, we can use the case of Ukraine quote, quote, double standard as using it as a precedent for calling for better uh, reaction and response to um, other issues. Well, ladies and gentlemen, ladies, dear friends, um, I think it was a very good panel, not because I'm standing here, but because uh, they actually really... They really brought perspectives that we will need to think about and reflect on and deal with. So again, thank you to my panelists, to our panelists, and thank you for listening and engaging. <laughs>